good evening everyone today i'll be presenting on the continuation of my previous class on erg so the topic is electrophysiology part 2 the first part that we saw um, around 2 months back was around was about full field ergs today a little more in detail on the extended and abbreviated protocols so the outline of today's class will be like this first i'll explain what each one is what are the normal waveforms and from where are these waveforms originating that means if some waveforms are abnormal where to localize the lesion as then we'll see a few examples or cases so today is a little longer class because i have lot of topics to cover up first one will be vep or visually evoked potentials then extended protocols in an erg i'll be speaking about three different extended protocols one will be photopic on off erg second one will be a dark adapted red flash erg and third third one will be an escon erg and the next thing is pattern erg and the last one abbreviated erg protocols so then we'll have a look about the multifocal ergs also so around 6 to 7 topics in total so coming to our first topic visually evoked potentials so visually evoked potentials basically gives us an idea about the functional integrity of the visual pathway it is not about the retina it is about the visual pathway in toto so any lesion anterior to the optic chiasm can be picked up by a visually evoked potential vep so there are basically three different protocols of vep one will be pattern reversal vep the next one will be pattern onset or offset vep third one will be a flash vep so one important thing to notice each type of or each protocol has has certain indications or in other, to say in other words all three pro protocols need not be done in a same patient you decide which protocol is needed for that particular patient depending on the vision depending on the cooperativeness of the patient depending on, on the uh, fixation ability of the patient and things like that so first coming to the pattern reversal vp this is the most common vp that is done most or most preferred in clinical settings and it is very less variable in the sense you can follow up a patient on pattern reversal vep very with a uh, very re high reliability so it uses checkerboard stimulus has large 1 degree pattern um, uh, checkerboards and also has smaller pattern of 0.25 degree checkerboards um so if you actually see between this and this whatever is white here will be black here whatever is black here will be white here so it is just reversal of the entire pattern that is why the name pattern reversal vep okay this is pattern onset offset vep wherein there is one pattern here and then when the pattern changes it becomes a gray stimulus there is no checkerboard here and this does not reverse it is either a checkerboard pattern and it directly becomes a gray stimulus this is a pattern onset offset vp okay this also has large checkerboards smaller checkerboards and this is preferred for patients who are have who have nystagmus who have poor fixation and for patients who are malingering so here for this pattern reversal vp to be done patient should at least have a vision of more than 6 by 18 so that the patient can fixate and cooperate so coming to the last one which is flash vp where there is brief flashes of light which subtends an angle of 20 degrees on the retina and this is for patients with poor optical quality or media haze so patients having dense media haze who will not be able to appreciate the patterns at all a flash vp will be a better modality so as i said all three vp all three protocols need not be done in a same patient though you can do two different types of vp for expecting future follow ups okay so electrodes i am not going to into the details of the electrodes and stimulation as we spoke earlier there is a pattern stimulation 
and this pattern stimulation should have a high contrast. So between the black and white checkerboards, there should at least be a high contrast difference of more than 80%. 100, better. At least 100% contrast difference, it is better. For protocol-wise, there should always be a range. So anything more than 80% should be there. So the square should have equal sides and meeting corners and weighing distances 50 to 150 centimeters. So the stimulus difference should be without change in average luminescence, luminance, which means from one checkerboard pattern and when the screen changes to the next checkerboard pattern, the luminance or the brightness of the screen should not change. If it changes, the waveforms will vary. So it should be standard. So always CRT monitors are better than LCD monitors because in LCD monitors, when the pattern changes, there will be a brief period of uh, gap between one and uh, another pattern. So CRT monitors are preferred, but we can still use LCD monitors, but there are few modifications that has to be done by the manufacturer to correct for that brief gap in the flash so that the luminous, luminance does not change. I hope all of you would have seen CRT monitors, cathode ray tube monitors, which have the older computer screens that you would have seen. Okay. And it is performed with normal room lights. So the same thing that I had spoke before, these patterns change. And these are certain specifications given by ISEV, where the reversal rate should be 2 plus or minus 0, 2 reversals per second for a pattern reversal stimuli, for a pattern onset offset. It becomes from checkerboard to a diffuse gray background. And for a pattern, for a flash stimuli, the flash should be less than 5 milliseconds. So these are all. And the flash intensity should be three candle up square, uh, uh, per uh, second per meter square. So these are all the standards given by ISEV. And this is one important thing to note for a full field ERG, we needed full pupillary dilatation. But for a VEP, we do not require pupillary dilatation. And monocular stimulation is standard, which means one eye is patched. But though if the patient is not fixing or in certain situations, you can still do binocular. So coming to the waveform analysis, there are two things that we need to know when analyzing a VP. One is peak time. It is time from the stimulus onset to the peak of a positive or negative wave. And time zero is the time of stimulus onset. So for a pattern reversal VP, we have three peaks, N75, P100, N135. So in today's class, whatever is N is a negative wave whatever is P is a positive wave that is standard. And this number that we are quoting after the N or P is the milliseconds after the stimulus onset. So N75 means it is the waveform that occurs approximately 75 milliseconds after stimulus onset. P100 is nothing but a waveform or a positive waveform that occurs anywhere after or anywhere around 100 milliseconds after stimulus onset. And N135 is a negative waveform that occurs around 135 milliseconds after stimulus onset. This holds good for this entire class on different modalities that I'll be speaking today. And the amplitude is the height of P100 wavelet. Amplitude of P100 wavelet is from the maximum peak here from this trough. Okay, this is the amplitude. So pattern onset offset VEP. So if we see here, one negative wave, one positive wave, again one negative wave. But when we see a pattern onset offset VEP, we see the positive wave first, then a negative wave, then a positive wave. It's almost ulta. Okay. Compare this here. First negative, positive, negative. Here positive, negative, positive. It's almost ulta. So in order for us people not to confuse these two. The nomenclature has been changed to, instead of N, P, it has changed to C1, C2, C3, okay? So C1, C2, C3 are three waveforms that we see in a pattern onset offset VEP. And on an average, C1 comes around 75 milliseconds from stimulus onset. C2 comes around 125 milliseconds from stimulus onset. And C3 comes around 150 milliseconds from stimulus onset. Coming to a flash VEP. This has plenty of almost six waves. Negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and positive. 
So here, since there are many waves, we don't want to confuse with numbers. So the standard ISEV has given it as one, two, three, four. So N1, N2, N3 are three negative waves. P1, P2, P3 are three positive waves. Okay. And what is of most important here is N2 and P2. N2 comes around 90 milliseconds and P2 comes around 120 milliseconds. These are the two waves that we are more worried about or what we are more looking into when we do a flash VP. Okay. So at least a minimum of two recordings to be done to confirm reproducibility and always all electrophysiological tests, be it VEP, be it ERG, be it extended protocols, be it MFERG, everything should need laboratory specific normative data, which means a VEP done in a different lab or in a different hospital cannot be compared to a VEP done in a, our hospital. Though the waveforms are similar, though the time is similar, it should have laboratory specific normative data. So reporting, so VEP can be abnormal in a variety of disorders. One disadvantage of doing a VEP is it cannot localize a lesion. It can say, yes, problem is there. No problem is not there. That is what it can say. It cannot localize the lesion to either at the optic chiasm, at the, um, it cannot localize the lesion to a specific point. It can only say, yes, it is abnormal. No, it is normal. That is what it can say. And values can be compared to normative data from the same lab. So. You do a VEP for a patient today. After six months, you repeat the VEP for, a, for the same patient today. And if it shows some reduce in the amplitudes compared to before, yes, it is significant if it is from the same lab. Or values compared to the other eye. So one eye is having little lower amplitudes or a delay in the amplitudes, delay in the peak time from one eye to the other. Yes, it is significant. Then values compared to previous reports. Indications, as I said, anywhere in the visual pathway, if there is a problem, this can pick up. This is mostly done for problems with the optic nerve and the visual pathway. So optic neuritis, yes, VEP will be abnormal. Compressive optic neuropathy, again, VEP is going to be abnormal. In a case of traumatic optic neuropathy, in a case of optic atrophy, yes, VEP is going to be abnormal. So this is more done for the visual pathway and not for the retinal status. This is about VEP. Coming to the extended protocols. So basically, what are these extended protocols? When we do a full field ERG, we get broad, brief, or a broad outline about the entire retinal function. As you would all remember, I was speaking about at least 20% of the retina should be affected for a full field ERG to become abnormal or to show us some difference in the waveforms. So these extended protocols are aimed at localizing the lesion furthermore. Okay. So if only B waves are abnormal with a normal A wave, where do you localize the lesion? We spoke about, yes, it is in the bipolar cells in the retina. So if it is because of that, where more to specify, specifically localize the lesion or what disease to think of? These extended protocols can give us little more idea about the uh, function of the retina. So photopic on-off ERG, as the name suggests, this is a light adapted ERG, photopic. So indications, any post-transduction abnormalities, any abnormal B wave in dark or light adapted with a relatively normal A wave. So you do a full field ERG first, you see that. If the A wave is grossly normal with reduced B wave amplitudes, then you would to further to get more information on that, we would like to do a photopic on off ERG. These are all extended protocols, which was initially not specified by ISEV. Many, uh, many people tried this on their own, then ISEV accepted it, standardized it, and then has published it. Okay. Now all these standards are available in the ISEV website. So most common diseases that can be picked up by a photopic on of ERG is congenital stationary night blindness. So congenital stationary night blindness, we were speaking about complete, incomplete and all. So whether it is complete or incomplete, whether it is affecting only the on bipolar cell pathway or only the off bipolar cell pathway, photopic on of ERG can pick it up. 
అండ్ మెల్నోమా అసోసియేటెడ్ రెట్నోపతి ఆటోమ్యూన్ రెట్నోపతి ఎక్స్లింక్ రెట్నోస్కైసిస్ అండ్ ఎక్స్క్యూ టాక్సిసిటీస్ ఆర్ అదర్ డిసీజెస్ విచ్ కెన్ బి పిక్ అప్ బై అ ఫోటోపిక్ ఆన్ ఆఫ్ ఇఆర్జి సో బేసికలీ హౌ డస్ అ ఫోటోపిక్ ఆన్ ఆఫ్ ఇఆర్జి లుక్ లైక్ సో ఇఫ్ ఐ గ్రాస్లీ లుకింగ్ అట్ దిస్ అలోన్ ఫర్గెట్ అబౌట్ దిస్ మార్కింగ్ వాట్ డస్ దిస్ లుక్ లైక్ కంపేర్ టు ద ఫుల్ ఫీల్డ్ ఇఆర్జి దిస్ లుక్స్ లైక్ అ ఫోటోపిక్ త్రీ జీరో రెస్పాన్స్ రైట్ ఫోటోపిక్ త్రీ జీరో రెస్పాన్స్ దర్ ఇస్ అన్ ఏ వేవ్ దర్ ఇస్ అ బి వేవ్ సిమిలర్ టు దాట్ వీ హ్యావ్ సో దిస్ ఇస్ కాల్డ్ ఎస్ ది ఆన్ రెస్పాన్స్ ఆర్ జస్ట్ ఆఫ్టర్ ఫ్లాష్ ఆన్ సెట్ దిస్ వే ఫామ్ అకర్స్ ఫ్లాష్ ఆన్ సెట్ సో దిస్ ఇస్ అన్ ఆన్ రెస్పాన్స్ అకర్స్ ఆఫ్టర్ స్టిమ్లస్ ఆన్ సెట్ దర్ ఆర్ బేసికలీ టూ వేవ్స్ విచ్ ఇస్ అ నెగటివ్ ఏ వేవ్ అండ్ అ పాజిటివ్ బి వేవ్ ద ఏ వేవ్ ఇస్ ఫ్రమ్ కోన్ రిసెప్టార్స్ అండ్ ఆఫ్ బైపోలార్ సెల్స్ అండ్ బి వేవ్ ఇస్ ఫ్రమ్ ఆన్ బైపోలార్ సెల్స్ సో ఆన్ రెస్పాన్స్ ఆన్ బైపోలార్ సెల్స్ occurs after stimulus onset on 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 okay resembles a photopic 30 response in a full field erg so this is an off response here we see two positive waves here one is a rapid onset positive wave second is a slow onset okay there is no negative wave here so this is an off response occurs after stimulus offset this wave to avoid confusion they have kept it as d wave so this is a wave b wave and this is d wave okay so this is a positive d wave which has two responses which is a rapid response which is the initial rapid response and the later slow response the initial rapid response is because of off bipolar cell activity and the later slow response is because of the cone photoreceptors so again off response occurs after stimulus offset and by the off bipolar cells on response occurs after stimulus onset by the on bipolar cells off response occurs after stimulus offset given by the off bipolar cells so this is the rapid on off response where it is like a flicker on off on off on off so both the waves come together but the amplitudes will be comparatively smaller if you see the amplitudes here and if you see the amplitudes here it is comparatively smaller because it's a brief flash okay so wave forms don't alter much it is the same negative a, a wave positive b wave and positive d wave rapid phase and the slow phase so common conditions as i said complete csnb complete csnb is a problem with the on bipolar cells so on bipolar cells only the on response will be affected so electronegative on response off response should be preserved whereas in an incomplete csnb it affects both the on and off bipolar cells so both is going to be affected and other on pathway dysfunction melanoma associated retinopathy and autoimmune retinopathy will affect only the on pathway specific on pathway okay so coming to the next extended protocol which is dark adapted red flash previous was photopic on off which was a light adapted response photopic light adapted this is dark adapted red flash so this needs standard 20 minutes dark adaptation for all routine full field ergs dark adaptation is standard 20 minutes unless in exceptions otherwise which i'll be speaking about so dark adapted and red flash so the flash is going to be red in color okay so you can either do a complete full field erg see how the response is then go in for doing a dark adapted ER, red flash erg after 20 minutes of dark adaptation again or if you are suspecting some disease which needs a dark adapted red flash erg for example a vitamin a deficiency if you are suspecting that when you write and send that you need a full field erg along with a dark adapted red flash erg okay they can do it together in between after the dark adapter 0.01 response which can save us 20 minutes of time okay so with one 20 minutes of dark adaptation you can do both the full field and the dark adapted extended protocol together or if you are not sure about the diagnosis do a full field erg see how the response is then request for an extended protocol okay so dark adapted red flash erg has two positive peaks one is the x wave and the b wave x wave is basically from the cones b wave is basically from the rods okay usually in a dark adapted state 
mostly only the rods are going to rods are going to respond which is mostly the b wave but with a red color flash with a prolonged or long wavelength flash there is also cone mediated response in the dark adapted state it doesn't mean in a dark state the cones does not fire at all the cones are still going to be active not as good as in the light adapted state but even in a dark adapted state the cones are going to respond so th that is what this extended protocol is picking up okay so there are two waves basically x wave and a b wave so b wave should be more than the x wave so when we see a dark adapted red flash ERG, two things we are going to note. One, are there two waves? Yes, no. If there are two waves, is the second wave higher than the first wave? Okay. Conditions, rod monochromacy, cone dystrophy, and to determine the origin of residual dark adapted ERG. What do they mean by residual dark adapted ERG is, when we see a full field ERG, the 0 0.01 response or the first box that we see in a full field ERG is going to be purely rod mediated. The next three, the dark adapted 0.3, I mean the dark adapted 10.0 and the dark adapted 3.0. All these three are combinedly set as mixed response. Why is it mixed response? Because both the rods and cones respond to it. Okay, it picks up activity from both the rods and cones. It's a mixed response. So in a mixed response, if the B wave is very small, okay, there is still a B wave, but it is of smaller amplitude, which means it could be from residual rod activity or from residual cone activity. So this dark adapter red, flare, red flash will pick up whether it is from the rod activity or the cone activity. So it can, for example, in the case of vitamin A deficiency, it can. This X wave is going to be normal. B wave is going to be absent or reduced. Okay. So it will pick up. It will further localize the lesion, or further give us more information about a very minimal B wave in a dark adapted mixed response. So that is when we do dark adapted red flash ERG. So. Whatever I explained now is the same that is written here. So usefulness, there's one more use variant since this is a dark adapted and uses a long wavelength flash. In patients who have photophobia and not tolerating a light adapted ERG, you can still do a dark adapted red flash ERG and get some gross information about rod system and cone system, whether only one system is affected or not. Obviously, it is not going to give us the entire information what a full field ERG is giving us. Okay, but in a patient who is not tolerating a full field ERG at all because of the photophobia, this could still be of some use. Okay, then generalized cone system dysfunction, X wave is going to be gone. There will be only B wave. Okay, then generalized retinal dysfunction to differentiate cone or rod spectrum abnormal. The same thing that I said. So, this is an example of whatever I spoke about right now. So you see here, dark adapted 0.01 ERG. Though A and B waves are marked, everything is noisy. These three, the light adapted ERGs are not shown here for want of space. So these three are the mixed responses, which means these three give us information about both the rod system and the cone system. We have an A wave. The B wave is still there, but is grossly reduced in amplitude which is a residual small B wave in the mixed response. So though this is dark adapted, this is mixed response, which means this B wave could be from the rod system or cone system, which has to be different, which can be differentiated with a dark adapted red flash, which shows a positive X wave, which means this is from the, from the louder cones. The rod system is gone. Okay, there is no B wave here, which means in this mixed response, this residual B wave is basically from the cone system and not from the rod system. This example is a case of vitamin A deficiency. Okay, so whatever is written there is what I spoke. Next extended protocol is the S cone ERG. So coming to the cone system, we have three different types of cones, the long and medium wavelength cones and the short wavelength cones. 
So this S cone ERG is going to differentiate between which type of cone system is affected, whether the long and medium wavelength cones are affected or the short wavelength cones are affected. Okay, so useful in rod monochromacy, S chrome monochromacy, and enhanced S cone, S -cone syndrome. This is how the waveform is going to look like. So basically, there are two peaks, two waveforms. The first peak is from the long, long and medium wavelength cones. The second peak is from the short wavelength cones. So why do we no, need to do this? Because standard ERG is dominated by long and medium wavelength cones. So any abnormality in the short wavelength cones can be masked by the long and medium wavelength cones. So we cannot obviously pick up any short wavelength cone abnormalities in a standard full field ERG. So this is further giving us more information about the short wavelength cones. So, so the protocol uses short wavelength, which is a blue flash on an amber colored background. Why amber colored background? Because it saturates the rods and gives us a cone mediated response. Any cone mediated response is going to be light adapted. OK. Any cone mediated response is going to be in a normal room light, light adapted state. OK. Any rod mediated response is going to be dark adapted state. That's all. This is basically the flash intensity. So the dimmer the flash that you give, you get only short wavelength cones. The brighter the flash that you give, you get both long and medium wavelength cones and the short wavelength cone response. OK? So this has been found out from studies that from gradual intensities, they have increased the flash, uh, flash intensity, and they've got two different types. Basically, for an S cone response, we are looking at this. First wave, long and medium wavelength cones. Second wave is short wavelength cones. That is what we are looking at. Okay. So stronger flash has two peaks. Dim stimulus has only one peak. Action spectrum, long and medium wavelength cones is around 520 nanometers wavelength, and the S cones is around 450 nanometers wavelength. So conditions where this is useful, S cone, S -cone monochromacy, where only the second peak, the short wavelength cones are only present, so only the second peak will be present. Tritonopia, first peak is normal, second peak is of very low amplitude. So Corresponding full field ERG will show reduced amplitude in the light adapted response. Cone response, so only light adapted ERG is going to be showing us abnormalities. And enhanced S cone syndrome again. Okay. I will show you in detail about enhanced S cone syndrome a little later. So, when do you do S cone ERG? Is when you see some abnormality in the light adapted response or color vision, okay, then. Based on full field ERG, we have three different divisions. We have divided full field ERG into three, right? Pure rod response, pure cone response, and mixed response. So when we see any abnormality in the mixed response or in the light adapted response, or any abnormality which is more pronounced in the light adapted response, an NS cone ERG will give us a little more information or will subdivide the further pathogenesis okay so for a dark adapted red flash what do you look for in a full field erg when do you order for a dark adapted red flash the previous topic that i spoke about dark adapted red flash the name says it all so any abnormality in the rod system or any abnormality in the rod response that you see in the full field erg a dark adapted red flash is going to give us a little more information Okay, enhanced S cone. I mean, sorry, the S cone ERG. Any abnormality that you see in the that is more pronounced in the light adapted response, and S cone ERG is going to give us further more information. So these are all basically extended protocols. You do a full field ERG, and you want to extend it further. So when do you extend what? You can't keep doing everything in a single patient and waste time and energy and resources, right? So if you know what to order for whom. So based on a full field ERG, you decide what you're going to order further. OK. So S cone ERG useful in localizing abnormal or diminished light adapted ERG. S cones transmit signal via on bipolar cell pathway. Any abnormality in on, on pathway will have a reduced S cone ERG. 
So again, complete CSNB is going to have a reduced ESCON ERG. Determine a deficiency, uh, reduced ESCON ERG, useful in monitoring and response to treatment. So vitamin A deficiency was more of raw response. Then why are we doing an ESCON ERG here? Though vitamin A deficiency, we say that it is more affecting only the rods. There is some amount of phone system also that is getting affected. It is basically photoreceptor dysfunction. There is no vitamin, vitamin A to the uh, cycle is disrupted. Okay, so this can be useful in monitoring and treatment response, but not more, more useful for diagnosis. For diagnosis, a dark adapted red flash is more useful. Okay, and anything in the on bipolar cell pathway or off bipolar cell pathway, what is the more preferred extended protocol? Photopic on off. Okay, the first topic that we spoke about. A photopic on off ERG is going to give us more information whether it is only on bipolar cell pathway or only off bipolar cell pathway or both. Okay, why this slide is here is if you order a different extended protocol, for example, for a CSNB case, if you order a photopic on off, you will get ideal information. If you accidentally or knowingly or unknowingly order a ESCON ERG also, even then you will get some abnormality. That doesn't mean the diagnosis varies. So the same disease can produce a lot of abnormalities in various protocols. You just need to know what is causing that exact disease and whether that is correlating to our ERG or not. That is all. So again, coming back to our point, Without a differential in our mind, if you randomly write for ERGs, you are going to get confused. Everything is going to be abnormal. You won't understand what is what. So always have a differential diagnosis in your mind before ordering an ERG. Order specifically and see whether that abnormality is correlating to your diagnosis. If you don't have a diagnosis or if you don't have a differential diagnosis and if you order n number of ERGs, we are never going to go anywhere close to a diagnosis, only with ERG. Okay, that is what this slide is about. So coming to pattern ERG. So far we saw everything about full field ERG and extended protocols. So pattern ERG is going to be more focused on the macular region. Okay more focused on the cone photoreceptors and the macular region. So macular and retinal ganglion cell function and contrast reversal pattern of contrast reversal of pattern stimuli. This is similar to our VP had similar checkerboard pattern. It is similar to that. It's a pattern ERG. So here we have three waveforms N for N negative, P for P positive. N35 is negative wave occurring around 35 milliseconds from stimulus onset. P50 is positive wave occurring around 50 milliseconds from stimulus onset and N95 is negative waveform that is occurring around 95 milliseconds from stimulus onset. So it can either be a checkerboard or a grating. It is a localized response from the macular region. Responses mostly from ganglion cells and the cone system. Valuable tool in neurological and ophthalmological practice. Useful to detect and monitor glaucoma, optic neuropathies, toxic maculopathies, ganglion cell dysfunction, or disease. So there is one more thing which can help us more in ganglion cell and optic nerve pathway, which is VEP. Okay, pattern ERG can also help us differentiate between retinal and optic nerve disease. So this is basically a transient response recorded at less than six reversals per second. Why reversals per second? Because from one pattern to another pattern, changing from the checkerboard actually reverses in the uh, white and black boxes. So that is considered as one reversal. So from one white to one black is one reversal. That is not considered as two. That is one reversal. So less than six reversal per second is standard. So it basically has three peaks. This I spoke about N35, P50, and N95. So P50 is basically from 45 to 60 milliseconds, the average. So amplitude from trough of N35 to peak of P50 and 
if n35 is poorly defined if you don't have an n35 at all you take it from the baseline from zero baseline okay so p50 basically arises from macla macla cones okay and n95 basically uh, arises from ganglion cells okay the amplitude measured between peaks and troughs implicit time and latency same as the entire thing every erg every electrophysiological this thing uh, uh, test you do implicit time and latency is the same there is no different definition so checker size is around 0.8 degrees plus or minus 0.2 degrees and everything is square you can use a 1 is to 1 aspect ratio screen or a 4 is to 3 aspect ratio screen depending on the lab both are acceptable according to iacv standards and which produces a 15 degree stimulus field this 15 degree is nothing but when the patient fixes straight this 15 degree is only the macla okay so contrast between white and black checkers same as i told for vep it should be more than 80 percent 100 the better in ordinary room lighting and one more important thing is this does not need dilatation okay so reversal rate 4 plus or minus 0 0.8 average anything less than 6 is accepted less than 6 reversals per second is accepted so patient preparation this does not require pupillary dilatation because patient has to fix and the macular area has to be projected with the checkerboard stimulus if at all patient has undergone some other investigation like an ffa or a fundus photo 30 minutes recovery time to be given this is standard for anything even for a full field erg if a patient has underwent some other investigation which used a bright light or bright flash better to have the patient sit around in normal room light condition for 30 minutes before you take the patient in for a protein erg testing leave apart the light adaptation and dark adaptation that is in the protocol this is before even you call the patient inside the erg room let the patient wait outside for 30 minutes in normal room light okay and refractive error for distance should be corrected to the screen similar to we similar to what we do for a visual fields so recording can be binocular or monocular at least at least 100 sweeps that are average that means it is repeated multiple times at least 100 times and the average is given that average waveform is what we see as the negative and positive waveforms if the waveform is too low if it is too low to be picked up at least 300 sweep should be done and then reporting should be given so we are worried about p50 and n95 these two are what we are worried about p50 is basically macular cones n95 is basically from the retinal ganglion cells so anything that affects the ganglion cells n95 is going to be affected anything that affects the macular cones p50 is going to be affected that's all we need to know so clinical significance optic nerve versus macular dysfunction so decreased n95 amplitudes it's an optic nerve dysfunction decreased p50 amplitude it's a macular dysfunction i am repeating this again and again in each and every slide so that we can remember it easily so seeing all these waveforms all these numbers all positive negatives at the end of the class we won't remember everything that is why i am repeating it again and again so in a, again optic neuropathy so what is going to happen n95 is going to be reduced with normal p50 that's all leave leave about uh, forget about the diseases okay so again multiple sclerosis there is going to be demyelination so it's an optic neuropathy basically so p50 is going to be normal and 95 is going to be reduced okay glaucoma similar thing in a case of heq toxicity macla is affected so what is going to get affected p50 so based on which wave is affected, we localize the lesion either to the ganglion cells or the macular cones. That's all. So that's all about the extended protocols. This is an abbreviated protocol. This abbreviated protocols was not there till 2021. This year, ISEV has published an updated version of doing a full field ERG, which included this abbreviated protocol. This is a newer one. So far, it is not being practiced in our institute because of the various advantages and disadvantages and it being new. Okay, so this abbreviated protocol has certain advantages. 
one it saves a lot of time okay two it can be done in an undilated pupil so just imagine leave about what i am going to speak just imagine a full field erg needs fully dilated pupils which is going to give certain amplitudes so what if you do the same full field erg in an undilated state what do we expect what do we expect this is standard way it is printed <coughs> okay so this is a full field right eye okay hmm. only right eye is projected here the left eye i have not shown so the first uh, hmm. waveform is the dark adapted 0.01 erg okay this is about which system you will talk about system yes yeah that shows only the rod response okay. predominantly okay. Whereas three response second third uh, and are uh, basically a mixoid response yes and then the fourth and fifth are the uh, photopic cone mediated responses the first wave mm. it shows uh, reduce a and this is a normal erg this is a normal full field there's nothing that is reduced okay so don't look for abnormalities in a normal erg always anyhow to interpret an ERG, we should have a normal Normative. ERG from the same lab by our sites to compare. Okay, so this is a normal full field ERG for people who have not attended a brief review. So there are basically six responses. First one is purely dark adapted rod response, which uses 0.01, which is the intensity of the flash. Okay, so 0.01 candela per meter square flash and this response is seen this response has a a wave and a b wave and most of the times this a wave cannot be picked up okay only b wave will be present most of the times there can be a small a wave so these three are basically mixed responses from both the cone and the rod system these three are again done in a dark adapted state okay so this has a a wave and a b wave the B wave has something here. It is not a straight line, right? There is something here. Those are wavelets. Those wavelets are separately shown here. These are called as oscillatory potentials. Anything, these oscillatory potentials should be at least four in number. So anything that affects the oscillatory potentials could be a vascular abnormality, be it a vein occlusion, example, or a diabetic retinopathy. Okay. So this has these three are mixed responses because it elicits response from both the rod, rods and the cone system why the cone system is excited is because of the brighter flash this is a three hertz flash and this is a 10 hertz flash so this because of the brighter flash it also has responses from the cone system also and this is light adapted erg which you which gives information about only the cone system or mostly about the cone system okay so this dark adapted erg requires minimum 20 minutes of dark adaptation prior to performing this and at least 10 minutes of light adaptation before performing this okay so at least 30 minutes is gone in adaptation apart from the time for performing the erg okay this is what is reduced by this abbreviated ERG protocol. So instead of those six things done together in a dilated state, this saves time for dilatation. So this is done in undilated pupil. Light adapted ERG is done first because you save that 10 minutes of light, light adaptation that you need to do. So light adapted 3 hertz and light adapted flicker is done. Even in a full field ERG, these two are the only purely light adapted responses. So there is no change in the light adapted responses in an abbreviated ERG protocol compared to the full field protocol. Okay, light adapted is same except for pupillary dilatation and the time for light adaptation. Okay, then instead of 20 minutes of dark adaptation, we do only 10 minutes of dark adaptation. And for dark adapted ERG, we had four responses there, right? 0 0.01, 3, 10, and the oscillatory potentials. We had four responses there, out of which we'll be doing only two, 0 0.01 and 10. Okay, so this saves time for, this saves time again. So there will be only four responses in a abbreviated ERG protocol. And 
ERG for people who have not attended the previous class, ERG is basically an electrical response arising from the retina. Okay, so the more amount of retina that is exposed, the more amplitudes you get. The less amount of retina that is exposed, the lesser amplitudes you get. Okay, so in an undilated pupil, the amount of retina that is exposed is less. So for an abbreviated ERG, even in a normal situation, you are going to get a reduced amplitude ERG, which is normal. So how much reduced is normal? How much reduced is abnormal? You should have laboratory specific normative data. So you perform the abbreviated ERG protocol in some normal individuals. Identify what, what amplitudes they get, record it, save it. So that when you do it for an abnormal patient, you can compare it with that normative data okay so why not do this for everyone this saves time this saves dilatation why not do this for everyone because it has some disadvantages also usefulness children saves time and cooperative patients yes you do it off fast disadvantages it does not give complete information because you are skipping off certain required things if the patient has a vein occlusion the oscillatory potentials will give us valuable information which is skipped off in an abbreviated ERG protocol okay so you do compromise on certain information when you do an abbreviated ERG protocol and as I said because of the lesser dark adaptation the retina is not fully dark adapted so the dark adapted 0 0.01 response is going to be further less. On a gross basis, amplitudes are going to be less. Out of which the dark adapted 0 0.01 response is going to be further reduced because the retina is not fully dark adapted. It is only a partial dark adaptation. Effect of undilated pupil reduces amplitudes. I spoke about this. Coming to the next one, MFERG or multifocal ERG. Actually, before this class, I had a very wrong conception that MFERG localizes lesions on the macula, which was a complete wrong concept. I don't know how many of you understand this. That was my concept before I read for this class. MFERG basically takes up around 24 to 25 degrees of the retina, which can be identified. Abnormalities in 25 degrees of the retina can be identified. So, which is equivalent to our visual fields 24 dash 2. So, anything that is abnormal in the visual fields of 24 dash 2, we can still do a MFERG to identify whether that is due to retinal pathology or something else. We can also differentiate glaucoma. Okay. So, it is a topographical measure of retinal activity. So this MFERG, multifocal ERG. What about focal ERG? What about focal ERG? Why did we directly move into multifocal ERG? Focal ERG is not of much clinical use, not performed in most institutes. That is why no one does focal ERG and everyone is doing multifocal ERG. Focal ERG has only one waveform right at the center, which is like needle in a haystack. Doesn't give us much of information. Okay, that is why we do multifocal ERG to map the entire retinal function or to get more topographical information. The full field ERG does give us information, but it does not localize the lesion exactly on the fundus, right? But this can localize the lesion exactly on the fundus. Okay, so it's a topographical measure of retinal activity. It is one or three focal ERG responses, and it is computer de derived. By that, what what it means is the previous ones, the previous ERGs that we all saw about, the negative waves, positive waves, one from ganglion cells, one from photoreceptors, this that. But this one is not from a specific area. When we go and see the MFERG being done, there is only one single continuous waveform that runs. And the, it is all computer derived, which splits that single continuous response 
into one or three focal responses. Okay, so this is all computer derived. This is not an actual response from a. This is not an actual electrical response from the retina. This is all computer derived responses, which is superimposed on a degrees. Okay, so there are one or three scaled hexagons. By scaled hexagons, what they mean is, if you see the size of the hexagon here and the size of the hexagon here, it is different, right? So to because the photoreceptors are more compact here and less compact here, the test is uh, designed in such a way that it derives more information from here and lesser information from the periphery. Okay, so these are scaled hexagons. The central sector has hexagons of three degrees size, peripheral sectors has hexagons of seven degrees size. Total, there are three rings, first ring five degrees, second ring 15 degrees, third ring is 25 degrees. Corresponds to HFA 24-2, HVF 24-2. Okay, so this is a 3D density map. Though this is black and white, whatever the uh, reports give will be too colorful. So the inner circle is 5 degrees, mid circle 15 degrees, outer circle 25 degrees corresponds to HPF 24-2, yes. So this is the colorful map that we get, 3D density plot. So when we speak about uh, visual fields, okay, there will be one thing on top, top right, which will have black and uh, gray scale, what we mean. What is the use of that gray scale? Only to explain to the patient, not of any other clinical explanation. It is only to explain to the patient. Same way, this 3D, 3D topography map is basically to explain to the patient. This is not what we look into when we get a MFERG report. What is more important is this. This is called a trace array. This trace array is the most important thing or the first thing and the last thing that we look at when we get an MFERG report. So this waveform, one negative, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative. This waveform should be uniform in all those 103 responses, okay? So this I told you about, continuous ERG recorded and extracted to multifocal responses, 103 responses, performed with room light on in light adapted state. So it's basically a response of the cone system. So this is how the continuously recorded ERG is, multifocal ERG, and the machine differentiates or derives it into this trace array. So this is how the screen looks like. There are multiple hexagons, which are dark, bright, and each time the pattern varies. When we saw for a pattern ERG or a VEP, you would have seen the uniformity, one black, one white, one black, one white, it was uniform. Here you don't see that uniformity. See, there are three blacks together here, three whites together here. So this is not uniform, okay? Same way, white can be white in the next frame, white can be black in the next frame, black can be black in the next frame. So who decides what happens to this hexagon in the next frame? It is all patented, fixed by the company, and it's a pseudo-random sequence, which means it is not an actual random sequence. It is a pseudo-random sequence, which has been patented by each and every manufacturer who makes the multifocal ERG machines. So it will vary from company to company but the effect is going to be the same because it's all derived. Then we have this, which is the summed up responses in each ring. So summed up responses in each ring, by this what we mean is, so we get responses from here. There are around approximately, for an example, around three, seven box, seven hexagons here. There are comparatively lesser hexagons or more hexagons in the outer ring. Okay, so when you sum up the responses, this is going to have a larger response, okay? The outer 
hexagons outer ring is going to have a larger response and the central ring is going to have a smaller response right agreed who does not agree with me everyone agrees the area covered by this is more so the electrical response initiated by this much of area is more compared to this area agreed okay so whatever comes in the center is going to have a lesser peak whatever comes from the periphery is going to have a going to have a slipped off going to have a larger peak then why is the center too high here and the periphery down here so what i am saying is the peripheral rings elicit a higher response the central rings elicit a lower response because of the area but our 3d topography map does not correspond to what i am saying so who agrees with me who does not agree with me it's already past 6 and i am only half way through my presentation so if you all want to go home fast answer fast density of cones are more in the center not periphery so in intensity of peaks will be more in the center as compared to no but the area is smaller no so this 3d topography map is not the actual response that is that we are getting this is also a derived response so multifocal erg is completely a derived response okay so what happens is so summed up responses this will exactly be the opposite summed up responses from the fovea will be less and as you go to the periphery it will be more okay so what they do is the computer what it derives is it divides it by unit area the response divided by unit area okay so this is called as response density which has seven rings so the response density from the center is more so divided by unit area as you said the response from the center and the periphery if you compare it as such periphery is going to be more but when you divide it by unit area okay center is going to be more periphery will be less because though the actual responses are higher it is covered over a large area so when you divide it by area the responses reduce so this is response density okay so whatever is in the center the response density will be more but the actual response will be less because of the area covered okay so the actual response so actual summed up responses in each ring is not shown in the report only the response density per unit area is shown in the report okay so coming to the waveform analysis all this is shown but none of this is right because these are all hypothetical this is arising from the on bipolar cells this is arising from the off bipolar cells this and that it's all a computer derived response it is not an actual response okay so many people have hypothesized that yes this peak can be from this this peak can be from this this is from the inner retinal influence this and that but it's all a computer derived response you, so you cannot rely on the actual waveform but you can rely on whether the waveform is present or not that's all we are worried about okay so it's all a mathematical extraction difficult to define the origin of the waves these are all hypothetical so usefulness bipolar res cell response with minimal contribution from the photoreceptors should be normal with ganglion cell disease or optic nerve dysfunction so that's what i said you can differentiate glaucoma from retinal disease with the abnormal 24-2 fields and an mferg okay limitations if the patient does not fixate well you won't get a good response and if the patient is having eccentric fixation instead of getting the peak in the center you will get the peak somewhere else at the periphery okay so always fixation should be monitored when you perform the test never rely on the 3d density plot why because some people have done the same thing instead of putting the instead of recording it on a individual they put the this thing what to say <coughs> they put the probe into uh, saline recorded mferg they still got a peak which means never rely on the 3d density plot but the trace arrays did not show any waves 3d density plot is basically difference between the trace arrays difference between one point and the other point so the 3d density plot can still show a peak 
based on the differences between one wave and the other. What we should look for is only the trace array, trace array and the response per unit area, that uh, density averages, okay? So always look into the trace array, needs age related and lab specific normative data. So coming to cases, I've put only few cases. So first case is an asymptomatic patient, known case of diabetes, hypertension, CKD, COPD, rheumatoid arthritis, which is highlighted in red, which means that is what the case is about. I'm giving a clue. Patient is on tablet hydroxychloroquine, 200 mg, once a day for the past three years, and his best corrected visual acuity is 6 by 5 and 6 in both eyes. Fundus? Posture pull fundus photos of right and left eye, hmm. along with... Uh... Anything abnormal that you note here? Patient is on HCQ. Patient is a known case of rheumatoid arthritis, diabetic, hypertension, CKD. Anything related to that do you note here? Is there any diabetic retinopathy changes? Is there any hypertensive retinopathy changes? Is there any anything else that you would want to look for? Mild pallor in the left eye disc and... Uh... Left eye disc, mild pallor, that could be because of the fun photo clarity also. Brighter flash will... Grossly normal. So Autofluorescence also grossly normal. Nothing abnormal that I can make out. So this is the initial MFERG. Again, a clue that we have done a follow-up MFERG. So what do we look at now? See this, is it normal? Normal, abnormal. The abnormal peak is... I said don't look at this at all. If someone yes. shows this to you and asks you if it is normal or abnormal, you should say, no, I want the trace array. Yes. I cannot comment whether this is normal or abnormal. So go to the trace array. What do you see? Person next to you. What do you see in the trace array? Anything abnormal that you note here? Any abnormal waveforms? Any flat waveforms? Hmm? Yes, no. That's all. Well, if you don't mind, you can always still, still see the 3D plot and the dark areas and compare there. See in the areas where they're showing dark. Superior areas. Uh, see no, what's happening to the trace the arrays. Two peaks. No, no. Look, don't look at the peak. Look at the trace array plot. The trace uh, see what is happening in the so trace area. The amplitudes are, are reduced as well as compare it. No, compare to its neighbors. In the trace area, superiorly the peaks are two little less in amplitude and as compared to the inferior as well as inferior tracer. This is the first one. So after six months, patient on HCQ. So this is a case of HCQ toxicity. Though we say HCQ toxicity occurs after eight years, at least after five years, patient can develop toxicity a little earlier also. This patient was on three years HCQ, but she was on and off. So we don't know the exact cumulative dose. Second case, patient is 11 year old child, was elsewhere diagnosed to have retinitis pigmentosa with cystoid macular edema, underwent injection of Ozodex. 11 year old child underwent two doses, one dose of Ozodex, one dose of Rezumab outside, born of non consanguineous marriage, no significant family history, best character visual equity, 6, 18, and 6. What do you expect in a fulfilled ERG? This patient comes to you. Do you order an ERG or not? If so, what ERG do you order? Fulfilled ERG. What do you expect? Uh, reduced cotopic responses. Hmm. Fulfilled ERG. So usually in a full-blown RP, you would expect a non-recordable response. But in a 11-year-old child, you can still expect some waveforms, some responses. So we would either expect grossly reduced photopic scotopic responses or at flat ERG. That's what we are expecting. Okay. So fundus. Who can describe the fundus to me? Next person. No, no. Yeah, I mean, he didn't answer. So uh, both our fundus shows uh, a normal disc at uh, the arterial attenuation. will have a pale disc, but grossly doesn't. No, no. Don't that. change. He just asked you. Don't change what you see. <laughs> it's a normal disc, but we, we find a pale disc. If it's an RP, we are expecting some amount of disc pallor. This yeah. looks like a normal disc. One point against RP. Next. Mild arteriolar attenuation is there, and uh, posterior pole has. I don't speed. notice much of arteriolar attenuation. I would still so say it as 2 is to 3 only. Peripheral left side, mildly, uh, not grossly attenuated, but. Left okay. eye has mid peripheral mild attenuation. Okay. And uh, only spicule. 
How many of you have seen Bonnie's Pickles? Day in and day out, we see RP. Are these Bonnie's Pickles? Mottling. These are pigment deposits, that's all. This is not the classical Bonnie's Pickles of RP. Okay. Then, there is diffuse RP mottling and there's autofluorescence. There is plenty of areas of hypo autofluorescence with relative central sparing. Okay, this is not this. I would not call this as hyper autofluorescence, central sparing. That's all. Okay, how many of you would still stick on to the diagnosis of RP? Full field ERG. Who can read this? Dark adopted 0.01 ERG shows extinguished A and B waves. Grossly reduced B wave, almost flat. Okay, agreed. Next, next set responses. Next set responses to uh, dark adopted 3.0 ERG also shows. Reduce the A wave and B wave. Grossly reduced. Here A wave is also reduced, B wave is also reduced. Here A wave looks okay. B wave is grossly reduced, almost at baseline. Light adapted. Light adapted. Hmm? Reduced A wave. Sorry. Light adapted 3.0. Grossly reduced B waves. Flicker. We are not getting a proper flicker response. It's all noise. Okay. So with this ERG alone, can we come to a diagnosis or do we need, do we need more info, information? What are the differentials that you would like to have? Rod system is affected, cone system is affected, pigmentation, diffuse RPA modeling, 11 year old child, color vision not done. Could be cone rod dystrophy, could be, but we did an extended protocol. We did an SCON ERG. Why did we do an SCON ERG? Basically, because light adapted responses are low and there is still some residual B wave here. If only residual B wave is here. You would prefer a dark adapted red flash ERG. But since the light adapted ERG is also reduced, we did an SCON ERG. Is this normal or abnormal? Someone from the front rows, normal, abnormal? Front rows, they will not answer that. Okay, the next person who has the mic. Okay, what does a normal s cone ERG waveform look like? How many peaks will be there? This is normal. I told there will be two peaks. First peak will be long and medium wavelength cones. Second peak will be short wavelength cones. The long and medium wavelength cone peak is absent here. Only the short wavelength cone peak is there. This is actually a case of enhanced s cone syndrome underwent genetic testing, which came back as NRL gene positive, but it was of uncertain significance. So we have called the parents for further genetic testing. Raja, can but, I interrupt in this case? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, can you go back to the full field yet? Yeah, I think the, the clue to asking for extended protocols and enhanced ESCON is if you look at the dark adapted uh, dark adapted 10 and you look at the light adapted 3 and if uh, no one was to put a label they both look similar and that is your clue that maybe we are dealing with an enhanced ESCON and that's so if you put that as your potential clinical diagnosis because of the numula pattern of uh, pigmentary changes around the arcades and then you see this full field ERG where the dark adapted and light adapted waveforms look almost similar then the technician themselves will go for the ESCON uh, test to confirm your enhanced test. Yes ma'am. Yeah so they do have they have a uniform smooth waveforms the cone response and the mixed response so that is something which is classic even if you have a flat uh, rod response okay so that is why they they will themselves do it the minute they look at the waveform not looking at the a and b and all that they just look at the uniformity of the waveform the smooth bell shape then they will say that let's look at this and then this comes correct yeah yes yeah, what uh, ma'am and sir told is correct. So the dark adapter 3 and light adapter 3 will have similar waveforms. So it will not have a proper oscillatory potentials in the ascending limb of B wave. 
and uh, the 30 hertz b wave uh, amplitude will be shorter than the light adapter uh, 3 erg c wave so that itself will be give a clue to do extended protocols like s l and m -co. so this is the next patient who is a 46 year old male who had a bcva of uh, 6 by 45 n8 in both eyes born of second degree consanguineous marriage and denies any family history of eye ailments Fundus, who can read the fundus for me? Who can say what it is here? Optic disc looks normal. Okay. Uh, vessels caliper is also okay. Mm. In the perifoveal region, I could see some uh, hypopigmented spots. Mm. And in Mellowish the left, flex kind of yeah. thing in the perifoveal region. region. Okay. So, OCT. And this is the autofluorescence. So we have foveal thinning, few hyperreflective dots here, and hypo and hyperreflective, hypo and hyper autofluorescent dots in the perifoveal region. So a full field ARG, grossly normal. Okay. Coming to the multifocal ARG. The foveal and perifoveal responses are reduced and in the outer area, this periphery waveforms are okay. Okay. So corresponding 3D map is also reduced. That central peak is gone. This is a case of, this is comparison for the normal and the abnormal 3D, I mean the density, uh, response density uh, per unit area. So the central peak should be more high, but the central peak is too low here. But the periphery is almost look the same. See the seventh ring, sixth ring, it's almost the same as normal. But the first, second ring, it should be this high, but it is this low. Okay. So this is a case of diagnosis. Targets. Okay. So next patient, 41 year old male, history of night blindness into 20 days. Recently diagnosed have diabetes two days back. He's a known alcoholic. History of chronic calcific pancreatitis, extrahepatic biliary obstruction, cholangitis, and underwent biliary stenting earlier. Earlier was around seven, eight years back. Okay. BCVA 66N6. Night blindness, 20 days. So it is recent onset night blindness. History of so many pathologies. Alcoholic. Okay. Since this is a case that I am showing here, I have mentioned all the positive findings here. But when the patient comes to you, you have to put leading questions to pick up these histories. Patient won't come and say, sit in your clinic and say, yes, yes, I'm drinking alcohol day in and day out. Now I'm seeing this, this. No. OK, so you have to pick all these up. History of night blindness for 20 days, you have to ask him whether there are any systemic parameters that can be affecting this, whether he's an alcoholic, whether there is any liver disease. I gave up the clue for this entire case now. Fundus, grossly normal. Vision 6, 5, and 6. But he specifically says defective night vision for the past 20 days. OCT, autofluorescence. Anything abnormal here? So there's foveal thinning. Where? Who said, who said foveal thinning? I feel the fovea is OK. I feel the fovea is OK. But if... If we have to challenge each other, we should have the normative data map. Okay, age related normative data map will be given by the OCT machine. Right, you have seen that green, red, yellow map, that ETDRS grid and all. Okay, if that is entirely green, that is a normal four wheel contour, normal four wheel thickness. Okay, if that is showing yellow for the age matched thing, it is less. So I would say this is normal four wheel contour, no thickening. No thinning. So full field ERG, grossly reduced, broad response, and relatively normal cone response. Patient has night blindness for the past 20 days, recent onset, acquired. So a dark adapted red flash ERG was done. I'm showing only the right eye. Is this normal, abnormal? How many waves they show? A, X, and B waves. What happens to B waves? 
X is what response, B is what response? Which receptor response? Vitamin A is a receptor disease. Photo phototransduction disease. Sir gave all the answers. Rod. Rod response. So B wave is from the rod response, X wave is from the cone response. We have a positive X wave which is normal. Our B wave should be more than the X wave. This is our normal red flash. Yeah, you should be dark adaptive red flash. B wave should be greater than the X wave and there should be two peaks. Our B wave is gone here. Okay. This is a case of vitamin A deficiency. We did a serum vitamin A levels, which was 15.2, normal is 30 to 80. We send the patient for vitamin A supplementation to the physician. History wise, he had alcohol. He's a, he was a known alcoholic, history of liver disease, pancreatitis. Everything was there for him. The next patient, 26 year old male, history of road traffic accident in June. He presented to us in August, almost two months, two to three months. Best corrected visual acuity, right eye denied light perception, left eye 6, 5, and 6. Fundus, disc is not seen, portal RD, two months old, history of trauma. Okay, so ultrasound, again total RD. This is not 100% widening of the ONH shadow, but Suspicion, suspicion of widening of the ONH shadow. What does it mean? Widening of the ONH shadow means could be optic nerve avulsion. Not hundred percent confirmatory on ultrasound. So what we did was a VEP. What VEP should we do? We spoke about three protocols in VEP. What are those three? Flash, pattern. Pattern onset offset, pattern reversal, and flash VEP. So, what VEP is best for this patient? Why flash? Because vision is too low. Okay. So, this is the left eye for comparison. We have those waveforms which are nice, good. Right eye, those waveforms are lost. This is almost a near non recordable VEP. So near non-recordable VEP, suspicion of ONH widening on ultrasound, denies light perception, total RD in a fresh or not so fresh, at least two months old duration, not of much visual potential. So patient was advised nil visual prognosis for the right eye, protective glasses for the left eye, and patient might not benefit from surgical intervention. In case. In spite of the suspicious widening of the ONH, if the patient had good VEP responses, surgery would have benefited him at least to some extent. So VEP does help us to prognosticate. Okay. So there's one more thing wherein patient denied PL. Okay. So in a trauma where there is so much of dense with him, corneal staining with hyphema, PL can be little, uh, what to say, confusing. Patient might not understand what is exact PL, okay, in terms of dense media hazes, especially in trauma. But this case, it was three months old. There was not much of corneal staining, hyphema, and all, but still. Okay, next patient, 43 year old male. Accidentally discovered poor vision in the right eye for the past one month. History of headache for the past one month. No history of trauma, no history of pain and ocular movements. History of using some inhaler for allergy. He was chronically on inhalers. Consulted locally and was diagnosed as very optic neuritis. I think uh, vision in the right eye was counting fingers close to face. Left eye was 6 by 5 and 6. Because of this, he did not notice it in the right eye. Whether this is only for one month, or more than this, we don't know because patient accidentally noticed it only one month ago. Okay. So he had an RAPD in the right eye. He also underwent uh, three three to four days of IV methylprednisolone followed by tapering dose of oral steroids, but no improvement in the vision. Fundus, right eye had blood disc margins, 
left eye was grossly normal. Very suddenly jumped to nasal endoscopy. It was on chronic inhaler use. Patient went to a routine ENT checkup. They suspected something abnormal. They did a nasal endoscopy, diagnosed him with allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. MRI done. There is a enlargement of the sinuses causing compression on the optic nerve. Okay. MRI report showed expansion of the ethmoid and spinoid sinuses. Again, confirms diagnosis of fungal sinusitis as per MRI. What VEP is best for this patient? What is this VEP actually? This is a flash VEP. Okay. So you're all still awake. So this is a flash VEP. So why flash VEP for this patient? Should we do some other VEP for this patient? Vision is counting fingers. Okay. Agreed. So you do a flash VEP now. So far we have concluded it as compressive optic neuropathy. Right. So will the vision improve or not? Will the vision improve or not after treatment? It can improve. It can improve. So in the first sitting also, though considering the vision, a flash VEP is a better modality. We are not looking only at diagnosis, but we are also looking at follow-up. So it is better to do flash VEP mainly to confirm compressive optic neuropathy, wherein the waveforms or the amplitudes in the left eye is good and in the right eye it is reduced compared to the other eye. And we also did a pattern reversal VEP where no specific waveforms were noted compared to the other eye. Other eye had normal N75, P100 and N135. Left eye, the right eye did not have such waveforms, but this is done in the first sitting so that if at all the vision improves, you can follow up on pattern reversal VEP. Okay, you need a baseline, right? If at all you did only flash VEP in the first sitting, when the vision improves, you might not be able to follow up based on VEP. So it is better to do both in this case so that this will help in the confirmation of the diagnosis. This will help in the follow up. Okay, so this is a case of compressive optic neuropathy. Next patient, 42 year old male, history of defective vision in both eyes, right eye more than the left eye for the past six months. Best corrected visual activity, 6 by 24 N12 in the right eye, 6 by 9 N6 in the left eye. History of papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Underwent thyroidectomy two months ago. Was diagnosed elsewhere as optic neuritis four months ago. History of IVMP four days, tapering dose of oral steroids, no response to treatment. And as grossly normal with mild disc, temporal pallor, only temporal pallor, not disc pallor, only temporal pallor. And does anything abnormal? I mean, autofluorescence and OCT. I don't have photos of the color fundus photos. Multicolor imaging was done for this patient, which did not show any temporal pallor. So I'm not putting that those images. Anything abnormal that you people can notice here? Vision is 624 and 19. Nothing grossly abnormal here. Autofluorescence also looks grossly okay. Apart from this area of hyper autofluorescence here. Full field ERG. What is the abnormality here? Hyper responsive AA. Only right eye is here. Left eye is, I have not put the left eye. B wave, ha B -wave has reduced response. B wave has reduced response. It's a lower amplitude B wave. Okay. Where? In dark adapted or dark adapted state, single flash rod response or a 0 0.01 B wave looks grossly okay. Mixed response A wave is okay, B wave is significantly reduced. Light adapted state grossly okay, maybe minimally reduced. Okay, MFERG reduced in uh, the central area, reduced central oh. this entire area it is reduced okay did we notice something on the autofluorescence or oct corresponding to this area no but if mferg shows this reduced responses that means it is coming from the retina it is not from the optic nerve agreed yes. so this is some retinal pathology that is affecting the central area and more affecting the rod system, especially B waves, which means it's a post phototransduction. Okay, abnormality. 
so we have more of a b wave abnormality here than the a waves so what erg is this dark adapted red flash this is a dark adapted red flash erg normal abnormal normal. this is normal we have two waves x wave b wave b wave is more than the x wave so this is normal this is a dark adapted red flash erg this is on photopic off. on off erg okay if you carefully see here the on response should have a a wave and a b wave b wave should be positive wave okay off response should have a positive d wave and a, a rapid component and a slow component agreed so the off response is grossly okay unaffected the on response is affected the b wave is not of that amplitude the b wave is grossly reduced but the same corresponding d wave on the off response is normal so this is affecting only the on bipolar cell pathway okay on a full field erg we had an abnormal b wave on extended testing we found out that that abnormal b wave is because of the we are further localizing it into on bipolar cells than the off bipolar cells off bipolar cells are grossly okay okay so so now we have two differentials patient had history of carcinoma agreed carcinoma underwent thyroidectomy and all so we have two differentials one is paraneoplastic another is autoimmune if it is autoimmune he should have improved with ivmp ivmp he did not improve so now we are ended up with the diagnosis of possible paraneoplastic syndrome they had also underwent uh, testing for paraneoplastic syndromes antibody testing he got one antibody positive which is associated with lung carcinoma but patient had only thyroid carcinoma there was no evidence of lung carcinoma he is still on follow up so to summarize electrophysiological tests helps us to localize the precise location of the disease if you suspect an optic nerve or visual pathway pathology you are aiming at a you are going to advise a vep okay in that vep if the patient has a good fixation and if it is a cooperative patient a pattern reversal vep is the best if the patient has poor fixation nystagmus a pattern onset offset vep is the best and if the patient has dense media haze or extremely poor vision like npli in such cases a flash vep is the best okay so for any optic nerve or visual pathway pathology we have vep under this we have three what to do for whom is what is summarized here then if you suspect a global retinal pathology a full field erg is going to pick up at least more than 20% of the retina should be affected for you to get an abnormal full field erg we saw a case of hcq toxicity we saw a case of stargardt disease where the full field erg was normal okay only the mferg showed as abnormalities an abnormal or reduced light adapted response s cone protocol will give us little more information if it is the long and medium wavelength cones or a short wavelength cone that is causing the abnormality it can differentiate between those two a waves normal with reduced b waves in dark adapted or light adapted state like the last case we saw paraneoplastic syndrome a wave should be normal with reduced b wave so only b wave getting at affected a photopic on off erg is going to give us more information significantly reduced dark adapted plus or minus abnormal light adapted response a dark adapted red flash protocol is going to give us little more information okay so any retinal pathology involving less than 20% of the retina mf erg is going to give us topographical detail on where exactly that problem is and if we suspect a macular pathology a pattern erg is going to be of helpful if it's an uncooperative child we need a reduced recording time an abbreviated erg protocol can be employed thank you